Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Guests, please welcome Chair Grijalva. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your time, for your endurance, uh, and I have a, a distinct uh, pleasure to introduce uh, someone who I've worked with and uh, had the pleasure of calling speaker and leader since I came to Congress many, many, not that many moons, but some moons ago. <laughs> uh, she's been a, a good and strong advocate on issues dealing with the environment, strong and good advocate about access and equity issues, and uh, she's kind enough to uh, Join us today and welcome all of you to this Environmental Justice Summit and, and share with you her thoughts and also her appreciation as well for being here today. It's very important to all of us and all of us here at, at the Capitol because the work ahead is going to be uh, something very important for all of us. And with that, uh, let me introduce the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Chairman Grijalva, for the invitation to be here today, for your kind introduction, but most importantly, for your relentless persistence, great persistent, great leadership on behalf of environmental justice, protecting our planet, our environment, God's gift to us. Thank you, Raul Grijalva, for your leadership. That's an applause line. <laughs> and I also want to join in acknowledging the leadership of Congressman Donald McEachin, relatively new to the Congress, uh, but really a mainstay of support for protecting our environment, recognizing the challenge of environmental justice. I'm very pleased to appoint him to the uh, uh, Select Committee on Climate. Uh, because of his, again, commitment to this issue in the state legislature in Virginia and now here in the Congress of the United States. And I salute them both for their leadership in holding listening set set sessions to lift up frontline communities' voices from Puerto Rico, New Mexico, Los Angeles. Here we are in Washington, D.C. Thank all of you. I know you're here because you're leaders in your community and have a constituency of your own on this subject. Thank you, experts and activists here. Last summer, I was honored to join many of you, some same ones here, for People Over Polluters Forum in Washington, D.C. Now I'm pleased to once again uh, to get the benefit of your contributions in terms of ideas to save our planet and have real justice. Environmental justice is as fundamental as it can, it can be. It's as fundamental as the air we breathe, the water we drink, the communities we live in. Every person deserves access to healthy, livable communities, to clean air, clean water, and to the beauty of God's creation, we all agree. Yet across America, many families, low-income families, rural communities, and communities of color face towering environmental injustices that take a cruel toll on their lives, their health, and their security. 
It is a moral injustice that many of our most vulnerable communities are forced to bear the greatest burden from environmental degradation. Sadly, this administration puts special interests before the public interest, rolling back key environmental protections and refusing to acknowledge science. Science. Polluting, putting polluters and dirty energy lobbyists in charge of decisions, pushing massive budget cuts uh, to initiatives for clean air, clean water, and health initiatives. The president's budget particularly hurts underserved communities, eliminating grants that ensure low-income families have clean water, clean water, eliminating initiatives to prevent and reduce lead poisoning, eliminating environmental justice enforcement initiatives, slashing infrastructure assistance for native communities, and more. At the same time, the White House is waging an unprecedented campaign of obstruction by refusing to comply with an oversight of their special interest attacks on public health. This is environmental justice is a public health issue. Our Democratic majority, with Mr. Grijalva as a chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, and aren't we proud and, and lucky, fortunate for that, our Democratic House majority is hard at work to reverse these attacks and build a cleaner, more equal future. Reestablishing a, a select committee on the climate crisis, Kathy Castor of Florida is chairing that. Uh, members in Mr. Mr. Grijalva's committee and other committees have held over 50 hearings on green job creating agenda, passed HR Now, Climate Action Now Act, and secured historic investments in clean energy, no giveaways to polluters. Together, we'll continue to advance community driven solutions to create good, good paying, green, good paying jobs, rebuild our infrastructure, protect public health. And we'll continue on to call on the Senate Republicans, uh, Chairman, I mean, Leader McConnell, to pass our bills. It is, uh, it's really a very interesting time for us because so much is at stake when you have an administration that rejects science, rejects knowledge, rejects experience, has no real interest in the public health making the decisions and putting people in place who are advocates for polluters, and that's just the way it is. So as we go forward, this is, we believe that this is God's creation and we have a moral responsibility to protect it, to be good stewards of it. And that's why we're able to work with the evangelical community in many cases because they too share that belief. But the climate issue is a health issue. It's a public health issue as you know better than anyone because you emphasize environmental justice. It's a public health issue. It's a jobs issue. It's a way that we can create good paying jobs at the same time as we protect our clean air and our clean water with new green technology. It's a national security issue. The national security experts all tell us uh, that the, uh, the challenge to our planet, whether it's my rising sea level levels, uh, encroachment of the deserts, drying up of the rivers, whatever it is, will cause migrations, will cause drought and famine and competition for resources and land, and that can lead to some uh, hostilities. So it's a national security issue. And also, again, it is a moral issue for us to uh, health, jobs, health, the economy, national security, God's creation even if you don't share that view, you do know that we have a moral responsibility to future generations, future generations to hand off this planet in a very responsible way. So know your power. Take good credit for what you are doing. It's really important that your voices be heard. It's great that you're here in DC because your voice needs to be heard here in terms of your understanding of our responsibility to our children, to our children. In the early days of our revolution, uh, Thomas Paine said, the times have found us. It was in the dark days of the revolution, the times have found us. We think the times have found us now. Not that we place ourselves in the category of greatness of our founders, 
but that we think that the challenge, the urgency of now that Dr. King talked about, the urgency is of such that the times have found us, and we must all take responsibility to use our time to save the planet, to save the children. So thank you for what you do. One of my favorite quotes about this is one when I was young, a teenager, and it's from President Kennedy. He said, the supreme reality of our time is our indivisibility as children of God and our common vulnerability on this planet. Thank you all for your leadership, for recognizing us all God's children, vulnerable and responsible, therefore, for each other, and determined to protect our planet and our children. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva. Joining Chairman Grijalva, please welcome the moderator of our next panel, Angela Logan, co-founder of East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice and campaign director of the Moving Forward Network, and our co-host, Representative Donald McKeeshan. So, um, Chair Gahalva and Representative McKeechan, I want to thank you very much for putting together this uh, Congressional Environmental Justice Convening. Um, if we can applaud the, the, the effort of putting this together so that we have the ability to express our opinions and our voice and our ideas on how we can address this critical um, issue moving forward. So I just want a, a round of applause maybe for the... I also want to make sure we recognize all the speakers that were here today in the collaborative process coming together to share knowledge, information, and solutions moving forward. So thank all the previous presenters. So one of the things that, um, as I was observing the presenters and the panelists today, there were a couple of common themes and common threads that I heard and I think that we could help to, uh, will help to inform our conversation and our work leading forward. Um, one of the, the common threads was that many communities across the country and across the world are being targeted um, from environmental assaults in their community, whether it's refineries, whether it's toxins, whether it's diesel pollution, there are many communities that are being targeted. We also know that those communities have local solutions for their communities. Um, the, the one thing that I heard over and over again today was that, that um, folks want to be at the table, right? So that they can move forward their community solutions to solve the problems. So in the um, spirit of uh, environmental justice and in the spirit of a collaborative process, we want to have this conversation today to figure out how we're going to work together to resolve this process resolve this issue and work towards environmental justice. So I have a couple of questions for you all, and uh, we know this is the beginning of a process, but let's have this conversation. So the first question I have for you all is, why have you chosen to elevate environmental justice as a policy priority? And what about both of your experiences makes this such an important issue to you? Well, as, as for me, and uh, first of all, let me uh, start off by thanking the chairman for uh, allowing me to help out with this uh, convening and also let me uh, thank my staff who did the real work in pulling all this together and just making me and uh, the chairman look good. Yeah, we appreciate that. Um, I don't want to talk too long, but to understand why I've chosen to uh, try to work with uh, the environmental justice community, you have to understand a little something about my journey. In 2001, there was a statewide election in Virginia where Mark Warner ran and won for governor, Tim Kaine ran and run, won for lieutenant governor. I ran and lost for attorney general, so I was out of elective office for 
what would amount to four years. I didn't know it was only going to be four years, but it ended up being four years. In, the, in February of 2005, I went to seminary. And uh, I went to seminary at the Samuel Dweck Proctor School of Theology at Virginia Union University, knowing absolutely nothing about seminary, being a, a complete blank slate, and found out that I had just parachuted into the middle of the religious left. I didn't even know there was a religious left. And uh, one of the things that I learned there was the, uh, creation care, the notion that we are put in the garden originally to take care of creation. That is still our charge from our God. And the other thing that you learn in seminary, or at least that was imparted in me in seminary, is, is that we have an obligation to speak up for the voiceless. And those folks who are uh, subject to environmental injustice are oftentimes the voiceless. They don't know how to vote. They don't vote. They don't know how to get to the Board of Zoning to you know, try to stop the <coughs> landfill from coming to their district or whatever it is that is uh, about to poison them. And so it just seems to me, in keeping with my ministry, that I really didn't intend to have. It was, it was supposed to be a learning experience, but the Lord had other plans. Um, it is uh, incumbent upon me to try to speak out for the voiceless, to be part of those who want to protect God's creation, and that leads me to environmental justice. The policy initiative and the focus for myself on envir environmental justice and equity issues uh, comes here and in and other, and other elected offices that I've had in my career uh, from the fact that it wasn't part of any conversation and that we, we've, we've kind of stereotyped that situation into kind of leaving it out of, of the mainstream dis discussions about environment and other issues. So, that bothered me and I felt that it needed to be part of it and it still bothers me and I feel it needs to be part of it. But the practical experience that taught me so much was uh, TCE contamination by the, Depart the Air Force and, and other manufacturers that happened in my hometown of Tucson, Arizona. And it happened, uh, the aquifer that was contaminated and polluted by the discharges uh, into the sewage system and then leaked and, uh, and uh, seeped into the aquifer was essentially in the predominantly uh, communities of color, working class and poor. And I remember going to my first meeting and it was the department, the county health department. They said, oh, there's no correlation between the high incidences of lupus, the high incidences of testicle cancer, the uh, high incidences of esophagus cancer, digestive cancer. There's no correlation between the TCE and that it probably has to do with people's diet and their lifestyle. And that insult built on some other things. Mm -hmm. And so we proceeded, we proceeded, litigation. Uh, the responsible parties were found responsible and they had to provide a cleanup and some monetary compensation for all the families that had been affected. Didn't solve the overall problem because after that, uh, I, I looked at where permitted admissions were that needed to have a, uh, admission, and they were all concentrated in those same areas. The landfill concentrated in near that area. And the list goes on and on. And, and, and so I felt that we had to tie this in. And at the same time, I was developing a conservation ethic, realizing the connection between the open space, the buffer zones around communities, what that watershed mean, what that habitat meant, and how it connected to making the life in these other communities better. And uh, I think that has been, uh, that was the experience and the motivation has always been uh, to make this environmental movement of which uh, I'm very proud of, would be a part of, uh, more inclusive, more representative, and more diverse. That's always been part of the goal. So environmental justice to me is both a civil rights issue and an environmental issue that, that bridges, I think, a very important uh, place for us as we go forward. So I, uh, that's, that has been, that's my history on this issue. But, and, 
And for EJ Voices, we have made an effort with Mr. McEachin's help to make sure that almost all our panels that we have, that that's the focus. That there's somebody there speaking to that issue over and over again, from indigenous communities to urban communities to rural communities. And if we're talking about climate change on a given situation, that those communities are also there. That's the representation part. Now, with uh, at Mr. McKeech's initiation and, and myself, now begin to work with you to put something together that's going to deal with that issue in a more permanent basis, a more codified basis for the future. Thank you. Um, can you share with us how you have approached this issue differently than the typical legislative process? And what were the steps that you have taken to ensure community's input is at the center of this effort? You know, I think about a year ago, uh, in conversations with Representative McEachin, uh, we want to create a, an inclusive and participatory process, a process that, uh, that, that would tackle the issue and... Could, could you mic closer to you, man? The, an, a, a, a process that would tackle the issue, to be inclusive, uh, and, and we started dealing with various organizations of which many are here today, if not all. And that EJ working group, I wanna thank you for your support. Amen. And then the areas of policy to focus on was the starting point of the discussion, the mechanisms for outreach. And like I said earlier today in, in welcoming you, you know, we did, the arrogance of us not knowing the prescriptive response to what we need to do uh, is something that uh, we didn't want that we, it's not something that we could write ourselves and that be the legislative instrument. It had to be, it had to be participatory in the pure sense of, the, of a democracy, and I think that would give it the strength we will need going forward. It'll give it the muscle we will need going forward, and it'll give it, I think, uh, the clarity that we need going forward because you have people that are practitioners in the sense that they represent communities EJ communities and the, the people from those communities themselves. So that was, that was the difference. I think uh, not looking at it typically a legislative initiative, but looking at it as a, a steps to ensure the community is there from the inception and the product and the legislative uh, win that we all hope and, and, and we'll work hard to make sure it occurs. All I can say to that is amen. Um, you know, typically when we deal with legislation, um, we'll deal with sort of the D.C. stakeholders and we'll put together a piece of legislation and then we'll roll it out. What the chairman and I seek to do with in, in this area is to make sure that we hear from you all, wherever you're situated, whether you're here in D.C. or whether you're scattered across the country, we want to hear from you all. And I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag too soon, but we're gonna do some rather innovative things, uh, at least I think are innovative, in that we've come up with your help, uh, a statement of principles uh, d dealing with environmental justice that we hope to turn into legislation. But before we do that, we're gonna put the state of, statement of principles online, and you all can go in there and comment on the statement of principles and share what you think or if you think it's a good principle, a bad principle or whatever. Then as we turn it into legislation, we're gonna do the same thing again, put it online and you all will have an opportunity to comment on the legislation. Uh, the key is here is that we want to be in a position where we're listening and hearing from you. Uh, we know that you all have the answers to the problems that exist in your community. Um, and that this needs to be a bottom-up solution rather than a top-down solution. Great. So the, uh, the environmental justice working group seems like a great mechanism and process for gathering information. Is, is that the only avenue that you've used or will use for hearing from community about environmental justice issues? Well, as I said, you, you're certainly going to have an opportunity to comment on the work product that it, we put out as we put it out. So that's one way that we get beyond just the Environmental um, Justice Task Force. But the other thing that we do um, is we go around, whether it's going around our state 
going around our region or even going around the country and listening to different EJ groups um, to make sure that we're hearing from you. I can't stress that enough. We need to hear from you. We don't, this is not the time for y'all to get shy and not have anything to say. Um, and you all don't look like a shy crowd anyway. And so um, that is the biggest piece of this is making sure that we're getting the input from you so that we're putting together a product that you can believe in and that you can help us pass through the Congress. I, I, I think as going forward, it's field hearings, visits, you know, from, from we've gone, you know, gone to the mountaintop removal process that's going on in Appalachia and what the consequences are to, to the people there. And the fact that one of the first studies that was canceled uh, by EPA was the study on the health e effects to the people there by the Trump administration. And to the coal ash in Puerto Rico and the effect there and the potential pipeline to what is going on with indigenous communities and tribal lands in terms of their right to have some control as, as to what is being done on their land, in their land, and that they have some input in the consultation process and with, with projects that are coming in adjacent to and affecting their members and their communities. And uh, the fundamental urban issues that all of us know about, clean air, clean water, and, and the public health consequences of polluting industries in those areas. Those are all part of it. But I think as different as they might be to some of us, they aren't. There's a, there's a cross, all of them, is a level of frustration, a level of not sense that they're not being heard and respected in that sense. And so field hearings, listening sessions, round tables, those are all part of uh, disseminating the urgency and at the same time taking the principles and working toward a product, a legislative product. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that, that it seems like both this, uh, the stakeholder group and the other outreach that is being conducted um, is really about a collaborative process and that this effort is not a final product but is about a start of a discussion, start of a co collaboration um, and, and a, a process. And that really is, gets to the, one of the core principles of environmental justice which is self-determination. Mm -hmm. So folks, voices and solutions need to be at the forefront and, and center. So um, with that said, um, would one of you like to uh, go through the, the statement of principles um, for the audience? Are they behind us? Well, I, well, that's a lot of reading, you know, and that, that, that's, <laughs> at some point your eyes will glaze over and so will mine. Uh, but I, I, I think suffice it to say that, that, uh, that this whole effort has been very important because it, it, you know, it's about strengthening community decision making, the ability of communities to determine their own sustainability and how they want to be, uh, uh, providing, uh, codifying the executive order so that it has teeth and is enforceable, uh, creating more collaborative policy making process, and we, this is the, that initiation of that effort, uh, and putting those communities most impacted uh, by this and other issues by each, uh, at the forefront of the engagement process in, the, in every conversation. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that overall the principles reflect where we want to go and they're there for your consumption, so, you know, but on the ground reality being a primary issue uh, and strengthening uh, the National Environmental Policy Act to promote environmental justice, to add that, to make that, <laughs> Strengthen that law by strengthening the utility of that law because more people will have access to use it in terms of redressing and dealing with environmental impacts. And uh, also strengthening the Civil Rights Act to ensure that citizens can enforce their rights against environmental discrimination. To, up, to bring that into the forefront and make the connection between civil rights and environmental issues. Uh, all those principles are uh, with the working group are part of what we believe represent the, 
the, ske the skeletal outline of what would be in a legislative uh, package. And uh, they're there. I think they're good. And, uh, and certainly changed, uh, changed my focus on a lot of things because uh, you know, the federal government needs to be needs to be directed to do some things that, are, that they're not doing now. Okay, thank you. No, I, w I was just going to add, uh, I ditto everything that the chairman said, but remember, what is this? This is a draft. We need to hear from you all. Yep. We need to hear from you all once it goes online as to what you think about this draft. We're not trying to shove it down anybody's throat. It's a draft, something to work with, and you, you get back to us on what you think about it. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, so, so we know this is a collaborative process. It is a process, it's a start, it's not a finish. So we look forward to working with you, your staff, and other members to really get to a point where we have a product that we can work on. That is about a process within the legislative um, agenda. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, we kind of jumped around the questions a little bit. I wanted to make sure there's, if you had anything else to add before we wrapped up this uh, great panel. Well, uh, you mean just add in general? Yes. Well, first of all, I want you all to give yourselves a round of applause because you all look marvelous. You really do. And it is encouraging to us that so many of you all made the trip to Washington to be with us today. Um, you know, oftentimes, uh, and I think the chairman can attest to this, this is a, uh, a slog for us. Uh, oftentimes, we always hear from the people who don't agree with us. Uh, we don't hear from those folks who are with us and who are rooting for us and who uh, need us to be successful. So your very presence here literally is the wind underneath our wings. We just want to encourage you to continue to stay in contact, not only with us, but with your local congressmen, your United States senators, but just as importantly, your local officials. Because quite frankly, local government, government being closer to you has more impact on you than we do in Washington. And I always tell people that politics is a contact sport. And what I mean by that is, is that you have to stay in contact with, you, with your legislators. Um, I didn't finish the story of my uh, movement to the EJ and to the environmental movement. I talked about seminary, seminary, but what I didn't talk about was this particular woman who decided that she had had enough of a uh, certain uh, state, state senator uh, who was uh, in my area and encouraged me to primary him. And what we did was, I mean, she literally walked in the sun with me to get my petition signed. She uh, walked in the rain with me. She knew, at some point, she knew all my children's birthdays. She knew my wife's birthday. And I knew hers. And all the time, all the time, like a broken record, she was all up in my ear about the environment. And people who do that, people who engage their local officials on a personal level are the ones who get their phone calls returned, are the ones who get their issues adopted. And it's because of her in seminary. Seminary was a spiritual, she was a natural. Um, that led me to the place where I am today, and I'll be forever grateful to her. Um, so I say that to say, you know, I didn't say a single thing about a dollar bill. It was all relationship. It was all getting to know one another. It was all becoming concerned on a human level about each other's concerns. If you can do that, if you have the ability to do that, you will change this country for the better and you will enhance our movement. So thank you all for being here. I personally, but I think we collectively are uh, very fortunate to to have uh, Mr. McEachin here in Congress to work with. I think he, not only the perspective, but uh, the clarity, the word I used before, is a clarity to how he says and does things in committee and other places as a congressman here, and uh, it's going to be good for all of us, and, uh, and I'm very, very happy and very proud. I, I just want to. I just want to add one thing in in, in 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 saying thank you to everybody. Angela, thank you very much. 
that we're building something here. And, and the speaker said these are consequential times that we're in. We know that. We know the lunacy that we're up against. We know the rollbacks that they've attempted on us. And this is a, for me, working on this, this participatory model is very important mm -hmm. because we are showing that once we do the cleansing, there's gonna come a time that these models are going to be not just the model, but the practice. And uh, and the more our constituencies feel that we're not just there to fight for them, which we are, but we're there to work for them, the better we're going to be. And I and I'm very encouraged by your presence here. It makes us proud uh, as he, that that you have taken the time to be here to lend a hand. Nothing is written in stone, as Mr. McEachin said. This is a participatory process. I'm sure we're gonna have some differences. I'm sure we're gonna have some mild arguments. I'm sure we're gonna have a different focuses on some priorities. But at the end of the day, trust me, we will have a comprehensive product that any of us can go from where, whatever part of our, the community in this country we're from and present it with a sense of pride and turn it into an instrument of purpose. That's the goal, and so thank you very much for being here. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so um, we heard about the, the principles, um, we heard about a process, we heard about the Environmental Justice Working Group, we heard about an engagement uh, um, process and plan, but there's also a, a development of an engagement tool that both the chair and the representative have put forward through Popbox um, so that we can, so they can gather and the staff can gather more information about how to deal, how to build this product. So um, with that said, I want to close this panel and invite up the representative from Popbox. Thank you. Please welcome Rashna Chowdhury from Popbox. Hi everyone, thank you so much for uh, inviting me and uh, enabling Popbox to be a part of this. Uh, I wanted to just give you a quick introduction of who I am and then talk about how this tool will work and why I'm so excited about it. Now many of you might be sitting there going, oh no, more technology, like not another social media platform or oh, do I have to create a new password and all that stuff. So we'll get to that later. So, so, but I'm excited about some other things, and um, uh, and and here's why. So, Popbox is a company I co-founded several years ago um, to help people share their own voice and not use form letters, but actually tell their own story in their own voice. And I'm excited to be here because. Every lawmaker that's come up here to talk about um, how the system usually for, works um, versus how, how, why this time it's different have been talking about people on the front lines and why they're the real issue experts and how to make sure that when this legislation gets drafted that they've heard from the real experts on the front line. And that includes everyone in, the, in this room. So, Popbox is a nonpartisan platform. You can go to popbox.com and find information on every single bill pending before Congress and write your own letter to your lawmaker. When the uh, Natural Resources Committee called us and said, hey, we have this idea about um, working with you on a new tool that makes sure every voice is heard in this process, we were like, yes, that's really exciting and it's never been done before. So we created this tool, and um, don't worry about the URL, we'll, we'll share that with you um, later. And this page literally just launched today. Um, but the goal of it is to amplify the community-led effort that you see here um, in a way that even the folks that didn't 
that weren't able to come here still are able to share their voice and join in this, um, in this effort uh, and um, to be a part of the conversation. Uh, Nancy Pelosi earlier today said, your voice needs to be here and here literally. Uh, but uh, as we all know, oftentimes when you talk about drafting legislation, uh, it's the local stakeholders, the folks that have lobbyists in DC or advocates in DC that can have the time to come to Capitol Hill to help draft legislation. They're, they have a seat at the table. What we wanna do with this tool is to make sure every single organization out there on the front lines are the ones um, that are part of that, that conversation. So you can think of Popbox as um, the technology to help harness all that input and feedback so that the committee has all of those voices. Now, um, what makes this interesting is when you go to Popbox, what we're gonna ask you to do is create uh, an account for yourself and for your organization. And then you'll just get to, well, read the statement of principles, which um, once you scroll down, there's, there's a lot more um, to this. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, and then you'll get to, um, uh, to weigh in, not just as an individual, um, but also as an organization. And at the very bottom of the page, after you read all the the information, it's really important stuff. Um, at the very bottom, you'll see the discussion, and you'll see a column for organizations, and you'll see a column for constituents and lawmakers. Now, I wanna focus on the organization part. Right now, it's blank, because we literally just launched this, but at some point, we'll have all of you weighing in um, as to what feedback and uh, input you want to provide the committee um, based on your own experiences um, from your organizations um, and the communities that you serve. Now, all of that is available transparently, so anyone can learn from it, um, and certainly we want all lawmakers involved in this effort um, to learn from it as well. In the column next to it is constituents. This is unique because we're not just inviting the organizations to be a part of this process, but also any constituent, anyone that wants to weigh in on these statements of principles will have that opportunity as well. Eventually, as this page gets populated, there will be a map where in real time you can see every single congressional district and um, how many people are weighing in from um, from all over the country. And that's really empowering too because not only are you able to see your own um, input up there, but also what people from your neighborhood or your state, but also folks from across the country are saying about um, this statement of principles. Now I just wanna reiterate, this has never been done before. A committee hasn't tried to make this such an inclusive and transparent process. So it's going to be a learning experience for, um, for Popbox especially, but for, for all of us as well. Um, and it's not just about uh, providing that input, but also being able to read what other people have to say. It's going to expand um, our, uh, uh, the thought process as well. Now, um, Chairman Grijalva kept talking about this is a skeleton, um, and the way we see um, the organization positions as well as the constituent positions is like putting meat on those bones, and that's why it's really important um, for uh, people to participate and then share it as well. Um, now, going back to like the three things that you need to do, First, you'll need to go to popvox.com and create an account um, for yourself and then a profile for your organization. There's a directory of stakeholders already on Popbox and you'd be able to find um, many, many DC organizations already on it. Um, if you're not, if you're, you don't see your organization there, um, add um, uh, your organization's profile. It takes about five minutes and it's free. Um, and then go to this page and add um, your organization's uh, input on the statement of principles. Now, you also have the opportunity to share it with your uh, members or your supporters in order for them to share their own issue expertise as well. 
Uh, and um, the entire page is also shareable on um, social media. So with one click, you can share it on Twitter um, or Facebook. Uh, and hopefully, as uh, the page gets more populated, more meat on those, those bones of the um, principles, there will be more information um, uh, to be shared as well. Uh, I want to just end um, very quickly by saying uh, this is a uh, this is, this is brand new, this hasn't been done before. So if you have questions on the technology um, aspect or questions about um, how to upload your information, uh, please feel free to talk to me directly about this. Um, I hope that there's a slide coming up with my contact information up oh, there. Um, and also if uh, your organization or organizations that you know don't have the time or resources to go and um, create the account and add um, position statements, then you can just email the position directly to us and we can just upload it um, for you. Um, I want to end by thanking you again and um, my email address is up there, um, but I'll also be here um, after um, uh, speaking in case you have specific questions for me as well. Um, thank you once again and um, I hope we get to really add a lot of meat to the skeleton. Thanks. Please give us a moment, moment until we transition to the strategy, strategy session. Attendees, please welcome Robert Garcia and Cynthia Mellon from the Environmental Justice Working Group, along with audience participants and members of staff for an interactive strategy session on advancing legislation and elevating EJ issues collaboratively.
Hello, folks. Thank you for staying with us. We're almost uh, done here, and we really appreciate all of your participation. Um, as the chairman mentioned um, and during the discussion, the idea is and always has been to make this process participatory and engaging. While we would love to bring every single person on stage, uh, capacity-wise, we're just not able to do that. So we are going to try an exercise. Um, our co-facilitators, Robert Garcia and Cynthia Mayon, are just as confused about this process <laughs> as you might be. Uh, so bear with us if it's a little clunky. But the main idea is we have three questions that we want to get your perspective on um, and find out what your top priorities are around those three questions. The way it's gonna work is our audience members and our co-facilitators are going to have a conversation around each question. They're going to come to consensus on three recommendations and then we're gonna put those recommendations to you. We're gonna ask you to go to this website www.menti.com. Enter this code, 106527, and respond to the questions that we put up there. Um, so with that, I want to have our co-facilitators, Robert Garcia uh, and Cynthia Mayon, uh, take it from here and introduce our audience members and start with the first question. First. I'll introduce myself. I think someone already did. My name is Cynthia Mayjohn. I'm the policy coordinator from the <clears throat> Climate Justice Alliance. I live in Newark, New Jersey. I'm also on the steering committee of New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance and um, of the Latino Action Network of New Jersey. I'm Robert Garcia. I'm a civil rights attorney and environmental justice advocate. I am founding director and counsel of the City Project. We are based in Los Angeles, California. My name is Kim Sutterth, and I am the Virginia Senior Organizer for Mothers Out Front. I got a ride home. <laughs> My name is Sharon Levine. I'm the director and founder of Rise St. James in St. James, Louisiana. I'm Melissa Miles. I'm the Environmental Justice Manager for Ironbound Community Corporation in Newark, New Jersey. We're also a member of the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance, Moving Forward Network, and Climate Justice Alliance. Hi, everybody. My name is Julian Gonzalez. I'm the Clean and Healthy Waters Program Manager with Green Latinos, based here in DC. So um, the way this works, is uh, we're going to put out a question, and uh, are we going to stand like cocktail party style, or can we can sit in the chairs? Okay, that's a good start. We'll sit in the chairs, and um, oh, that's my stuff. Okay. I really want to assure you that this was a randomly selected group. That this is not rigged, so you're going to hear real convo and uh, real debate. And uh, I hope you'll join us in the same spirit. The first question that we've been asked to uh, grapple with here is, what key activities can members, staff, and EJ advocates replicate across the country that will propel the issue forward? So I think we should just look at that before we go on. And I think we've all, at some point, this crowd uh, interacted with their representatives and also with other bodies. Some of us in, you know, were involved in like looking at bills with, with uh, Congress people and so on and debating that. But um, a lot of different ideas get floated. What do you, what do you think uh, we should really be focusing on to move EJ forward? Can we just jump in? Yes. Okay. Please do. Um, one suggestion I had was to hire, train, and receive direction from directly impacted people, especially those who are black and brown. Okay, with my organization, we are beginning to educate the people on what's going on with climate change. And we're trying to get the word out to our pastors in St. James and also to uh, the community. 
First of all, we canvass by giving information to the communities and we invite them to come to public meetings to educate them on what's going on. Remember, we're looking for three recommendations from the four of you. Yeah. Um, well, I would start by not ignoring the, es the expertise that's in EJ communities when bills are proposed. Um, for example, I just um, on Instagram got an action alert um, that uh, New Jersey Senator Bob Smith um, sponsoring a bill uh, 1206 um, that includes incineration. Um, you know, we the EJ community has been talking about incineration for decades. I don't understand how bills continue to come up, and you know, experts from every field are consulted. And the folks who have been talking about this for decades are completely ignored. And I, I just feel like that is the first step. Stop ignoring us. <laughs> Building on what everybody just said, um, when, taking advan when, when seeking the expertise of those directly affected on environmental issues, um, staff of members of Congress can also think of leverages points, uh, for example, Green Latinos and other organizations throughout the country um, often have the ability to convene a lot, to convene people from these communities. And individuals have that on a personal level, whether it's people who you go to church with or people who you play basketball with. And elected officials locally and here in DC can take advantage of those leverage points to really get lots of input that they really need. and those kind of things shouldn't remain informal. They can be formalized briefings just like any other industry gets, just like any other large organization here in DC gets. So what's your recommendation in a sentence? Schedule briefings where people come in and teach you about things you don't know if you're the staff of elected officials or the staff of elected officials at the state level as well. Can you restate in one sentence your recommendation? One sentence was hire, train, and receive direction from directly impacted people, especially black and brown. Mine is to educate the public on what's going on with climate change. So that's four, so the four of you need to select the three best. <laughs> They're all so good. Combine one. Yeah. Ah. The education one. Combine the education with, uh, um, with which one? Educating. And informing. Well, no, that's the same one. You said educating the public on climate change, and you said. Mine, I kind of cheated and gave two. <laughs> Convening, using points of leverage to get different perspectives, and then one way to do that, an example of that is scheduling briefings um, with elected officials where directly affected community folks can teach them. Yes, but we need ah. to combine into three now. So it sounds like, edu yeah. like elected officials educating the public and public educating yeah. elected yeah. officials. Maybe we can make Two-way conversation. Yeah. Maybe at the end. Okay, is that all we're allowed there? That's, is that enough? So which of these four, first of all, did I capture them correctly? Which of these four, four what would be your top three as a group? So we combined mm -hmm. two, and then we have the other two. So which we had- Which two are you combining? Um, the using the convening power, the second part of that was education, so we, com we combine that with the education of the public. Use convening power for? Yeah, it's already, it's already up on the other um, easel. Take expertise 
directly from the environmental justice community as well. Thank you. Now, do they vote or do we go on to question two? Okay, now we're gonna ask our uh, team to type that into the uh, Mentee website. Uh, the first is education and two-way conversations using convening power. The second is hire, train, and receive direction particularly from communities of color. And, and the third is take expertise directly from the EJ community. Now what we're gonna ask you all to do is go to the website, www.menti.com, and Jonathan, if we could put that uh, uh, slide up so everyone can get the website. The code is at the top there, 9321159. And we're gonna ask you to select which of these three are your favorite as an audience, and we'll be able to see the results. This is so exciting. Oh, it's right there. I can see it. I began. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Fire game. Yeah, that's my favorite. Like a horse race. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Fire game. Yeah, and then you'll, you'll get the full package if you, you know, just try it. NBC News has called it for number two. <laughs> okay, I think we have a pretty good sense. Uh, votes are still coming in, but it looks like the top is hire, train, and receive direction from communities of color. The second highest is take expertise directly from the EJ community. And the third is education and two-way conversations using convening power. So what we plan to do is to share this uh, with uh, our uh, um, bosses and uh, with our team um, as important feedback for what we should be looking towards when we um, plan our activities and when we reach out to EJ communities on different tasks that we can do together. Um, so thank you all for participating in that first question. Okay, question number two, and we can do this more quickly since we've learned how to do it. <laughs> how can grassroots environmental justice, how can grassroots environmental justice groups share their input and perspectives through the formal federal legislative process. Let's start over here on my left this time. And remember, we're going through one sentence apiece, and then we'll select three of those. So the first one of many opportunities to do that is in regulatory processes with, with, for rulemaking, where they have comment periods. Um, it's a chance for folks in different communities and different organizations to submit feedback that is as detailed as they want it to be on uh, undertakings by this administration. 
Um, personally, after uh, spending the day yesterday with Moving Forward Network um, representatives, talking to my legislators about uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, I really see the benefit in the face-to-face um, -face meetings. Um, and I know that it can be difficult for communities to actually get to DC, but um, I don't think that anything beats face-to-face -face dialogue. Well, I think that we should meet with our local officials, public officials, and also with people in the Senate and our representatives, talk with them and find out what's going on and give them our input, then share it with our groups and with our communities. And whenever we have meetings, share it with our members of our, mem members of our organizations that we have formed. And just like I said, try to educate the people and speak out and tell them what we need. Um, I hope this isn't redundant, but um, definitely meeting with our um, policy representatives, Congress folks, and um, Senate. But I wanted to add, um, and I'll just go ahead and be a little vulnerable. I am not well versed in policy. And so it's difficult for me to say, this is what I want in your policy. Um, so I think this is also one of those opportunities to learn from our representatives. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a suggestion of some trainings, both um, and I, another embarrassing moment. The first time I met Congressman McEachin, and he's local, was here in D.C., and he's right down the road from me. So there should be a lot more of this kind of discussion individually. It'd be, it would be difficult to ask people from across the country to come here. So we need to bring it out to the people. So I'm thinking trainings and paid internships so that we can learn how the policy actually works. Okay. That's four. Now the three, the four of you need to select the three best that the audience will vote on. The face-to-face -face meeting, and it sounded more like shared education and opportunities for exchanges, both at the at the state, local, and federal level. We talked about greater engagement, and then also internships. We paid, talked about as well. Paid. 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 <laughs> I think the rulemaking and comment period NEPA stuff can get folded into education. Okay. Um, just making folks like that's part of understanding what opportunities you have. It's not limited to only rulemaking comment periods. That's just an example. I don't know. I might, I might combine the meetings with the elected officials, with the meetings, with legislators, because it's all in the same theme. I really like um, what you said, Kim, about uh, the local meetings with federal representatives. I think that is excellent. Yes, I agree with that, I should just say. Yeah, and they all are in their district fairly often. You don't have to come to Washington. You just watch the calendar for when they're going to be there and have those meetings. Do we have three? So if you could just restate the three one more time in a sentence that we can type in. Okay. So um, education and sharing, including how to participate in comment periods for rules, very good, very good. which can often also happen in person. You don't have to write it. Uh, and then number two, face-to-face -face meetings with federal and local uh, state uh, officials with your meet with your Congress people. And the third, and prob well, we I won't sway the vote, but. Um, <laughs> having paid internships of people from the community who are going to actually act as liaisons and help people learn how to do this stuff. <laughs> okay. Ready to vote. Were you able to capture that, Jonathan? We could just repeat it one more time so we can I think the it. last one it says meet with local reps what we're saying is meet meet locally with both state 
and state officials and legislators. So meet locally with state officials and legislators. Or meet with your local state officials. Or but meet them locally. Yeah. <laughs> but and, and you can meet them at home. You don't have yes. to come here. <laughs> yeah. In the district. How are we doing, Jonathan? Let's see if we got there. Oh, it's up. It's up. Oh, back there. Okay. Uh, menti.com using the code 932115. Where's the, where's the internships? It's coming in last. Nine, That's nine, weird. Uh oh, making a comeback. Yeah, there's definitely overlap. I feel like I want to like mm. politics on my idea. I'm with face to face number two <laughs> with education. Oh no, we've gotten this one. Yeah. Yeah. We can't expect people to work for free. Yeah. Okay, number three is making a late comeback. I see. What do we do if there's a tie? Gotta do it over? Why? I don't I did. <laughs> we decided this after school came back. <laughs> I could see them all. Seven and four. Oh, I see that. I think we have our top education, paid internships. The second is meet with local representatives. Locally. And the third is face-to-face uh, -face meetings, making sure that uh, community members have an opportunity to engage directly with their members. Well, the popular vote shows money talks. <laughs> <laughs> so the last okay. question. I, um, uh, Robert, before we go to the last question, I think we're going to take one quick break um, and um, reconvene for that last question. Um, I believe we have a, um, a um, member who is uh, on his way to address the audience. Great. Um, but in the interim, if you could please all uh, join me in thanking our audience members for participating in this exercise. So we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back in just one moment.
And now, please welcome Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. I apologize for interrupting your panel. <laughs> but I, I am so pleased to be here. Uh, but more importantly, I'm pleased that you're here. I'm pleased that you're here to uh, discuss one of the most critical uh, challenges facing our global community. Um, and I want to assure you on behalf of, I don't know whether Speaker Pelosi has had the opportunity to be here. Was she here today? Uh, I'm sure she assured you uh, that we are focused very, very heavily on the issue of climate, uh, on the issue of the environment, on the issue of the consequences uh, particularly to the most vulnerable in our globe, yes, in our country, but also globally, uh, to the changes in climate, to the changes uh, in environment. Uh, and we have a number of activities going on. Kathy Castor, as you know, from Florida, has been appointed the chair of our task force on this. On our, I think it's not a task force, it's a special uh, committee. Uh, is that what it is? Select committee. Select committee. Uh, and the reason we have done that is because we want that particular focus heightened around the country. But it is also important for you to be here and talk to members about your concerns, uh, particularly in, as I said, vulnerable communities. Uh, frankly, there are some people who can insulate themselves better from the consequences of uh, climate change than some other people can. And we need to make sure that we, on their behalf, focus on those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and I know that many of you represent communities, uh, communities who are vulnerable, communities who are uh, geographically, uh, like the Eighth Ward in, in New Orleans, uh, very vulnerable. So I wanted to come by. We just got through some meetings. We're in the last uh, day and a half of the session. Uh, we hope, uh, uh, for the uh, July 4th break. Uh, but I wanted to make sure I got here to thank you and to say uh, that you need to keep on keeping on. There will be days of frustration. There will be days of, uh, many days, uh, when we don't move forward as quickly or as far as we want to. Uh, but uh, generations yet to come are counting on all of us. And if we don't do our job, their lives uh, will be disadvantaged. Uh, I happen to have grandchildren. Some of you I know have children. Uh, I don't know whether anybody out there has grandchildren, but uh, uh, in any event, oh, we have a grandmother there and a grandfather here. Uh, my name is Heap Up uh, for my <laughs> grandchildren. But uh, 
John Kennedy uh, was an inspiration to me, which is why I got into politics many years ago. Uh, and he uh, was quoted and, and said in the inaugural address that he gave in 1961, the energy, the faith, the devotion we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And I think that applies to all of us as it relates to this issue. Because we need to bring our energy and our faith and our devotion to a cause that is bigger than all of us and one of the biggest that we have confronted. As you know, we passed legislation not too long ago uh, which said that uh, uh, we did not want a single cent spent to undermine the Paris Accord uh, that President Obama uh, entered into. Uh, and the good news is many of our corporations have said that they are going to follow Paris no matter what the president did. Why? Because they know in the final analysis it is to their benefit. Economically, uh, it's to their benefit. Because they know that what we're doing now is not sustainable. They also know that we do not have time to waste. And that's why you're here. To, to convey a sense of urgency, a sense, a sense of immediacy, uh, Martin Luther King talked about the, fir the, 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 the urgency of now. Uh, and that's where you are. I want you to know that's what we are. And we count on you, and we want you to know you can count on us. God bless you. Thank you very much. Get out of the way. <laughs> do you want to do the last question, Chris? Unfortunately, I've been told by our control booth that we've run out of time, but I do want to uh, thank you all as audience members, and I want to thank you all as the audience for participating in our... <laughs> you can tell I don't do this. Um, for participating uh, in, in our strategy session here. So uh, please join me in giving our audience participants a, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Honored guests, thank you so much for your participation in this congressional convening on environmental justice, co-hosted by Sherman Grijalva and Representative McKeeshan. The program has now concluded. Please feel free to share any additional comments or perspectives with the committee staff at nrd underscore justice underscore project at mail.house.gov and visit the committee's website to provide continued feedback and input throughout the process at naturalresources.house.gov forward slash environmental dash justice. Thank you.
the scented marker is ours. Mr. Sketch. Yeah, Weston, yeah. Okay, perfect, wonderful. Okay. Let me know if you're missing anything, if I can help you with anything. Okay. 